If we were to end the conference right now, which of course is not going to happen, and if you were going to hop in your car now and drive back home or fly back home, wherever you're going, what, what would you suspect might linger from what I said this morning? What do you think would kind of stay on your mind and you kind of chew on it? Let me tell you why I asked the question. Years ago, I was listening to a, a wonderful woman speaker who was leading a conference, and I happened to be in the audience there. And she said a sentence that she opened up that really struck me. This goes back a number of years. She said, in the next many hours, I imagine I'll probably say 50,000 sentences. And my guess is, it always seems to be this case, that people hear about two of them. And she I used to be offended by that, but now I realize those two were designed by the Spirit of God to be heard by that particular person. So that makes me wonder, what, what did you hear this morning that didn't come from me, but came from the Spirit of God that you might want to chew on, think about, process a little bit, wrestle with? What, what, what did you hear that you'd chew on as you, yeah? A woman receives and a man moves, yeah. Did that resonate with you? Yeah. 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 fully alive, I, I talk about what I call the bridge of connection. And um, God intends that we connect with each other, not by Facebook only, <laughs> but at a deep soul-to-soul -soul level. What, is, what does that look like? Um, how do they connect with each other? We're going to look at that a little bit this morning, but the bridge of connection, the way I visualize that is I... I picture um, the two genders, a man on this side of the bridge, a woman on this side of the bridge, and it's a very narrow bridge, maybe it's a narrow road, but both people want to connect. I'm not talking about sexual connection, I'm talking about soul connection. They, they want to connect as brothers and sisters, certainly as husbands and wives, including sex, but we're talking about relationality. And it seems to me that if a woman is going to be relationally feminine, that she's going to be on this end of the bridge like this, just as Jesus said, um, come to me all your labor and have you laid and I'll give you rest. And just as Jesus, when he wept over Jerusalem, he said essentially these words, these are not the exact words, but this is the gist, I, 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 I came to you and I, I wanted you to come to me, but, but you wouldn't come. You see, when a woman opens herself and by staying on this side of the bridge and says, come to me, she's running a terrible risk, nobody might come. So because she's terrified, she does this. And a man over here, as a, the, the design is for the woman to be open to, open to receive and supply to nourish, and the man is to remember the larger story of God. I didn't make that point this morning, but just the larger story of God, which began an eternity past when there was no one and nothing but God. And they weren't lonely, they were having a good time. And they made us to share in the good time they invited us into their community, but in order for that to happen, they had to move into our community, into the mess of it. And so if the man remembers the story of God, he's gonna move across the bridge and the woman's gonna receive him. And the problem in most relationships is the man says, I don't know how to move, so I'll stay over here. And the woman says, but I want you. And so she runs across the bridge and tries to get him. And that screws the whole thing up. So that's, uh, I appreciate that thought, yeah. What else, what else would you, yeah. Yes, 
Yeah, risk is such a part. Yeah. Risk is such a part of the call. I know it was a throwaway little funny line when I said this person needs professional help. But let me tell you, I have felt that. And uh, it's, it's easier for me to sit here and teach and to write books than to actually talk to people. <laughs> um, and it's even harder to move meaningfully into my wife and into my two sons, into my two daughters-in-law, and into my five grandchildren. It's not, it's not easy. I tend to banter very easily, and we love to laugh, and, and I can easily just keep it there. And it was difficult. My older son turned 46 just yesterday, and before I flew out here, I, we have a little party planned Monday night, but I, I called him, and I could feel myself getting nervous calling him because I wanted to speak from the depths of who I am. I didn't, I didn't want to just call and say, hey, man, happy birthday, getting a little older, huh? And nothing's wrong with just fun stuff, but isn't there something deeper about me that wants to pour into my son? And it was kind of awkward. Um, I was with him, my older boy, um, Three days ago, I guess it was, I was at his home. He lives just 15 minutes from where we live in Denver. And we got talking about some other couple that have become kind of problematic in our lives. And my son got a little testy, and he just began to, just then very briefly, he just kind of swore about them. I don't like it. It's not right to do. And I didn't, didn't say much, but all the way home I prayed Lord, you know what I'd love to see happen? I'd love for him to call me and apologize <laughs> for failing as he did as a relationally masculine man. So I got home, and I was doing some work, and I made sure I had my phone next to me just in case God wanted to answer that prayer. The phone rang, and he called. He said, Dad, I am so sorry. Man, I was so grateful for that. One or two more? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to this session. Yeah, yeah. I, one of my associates is a woman who, when she's heard me do gender conferences, she said, you always talk more about femininity than masculinity. Why don't you talk about men more? So I'll do that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, in the back, I think I saw a woman stand up, yeah. Praise the Lord for that. That's so good. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. That's what? Yeah, oh, fair, fair enough. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the subtitle of my book is God's Vision for Gender that Frees Men and Women to Live Beyond Stereotypes. And I, I hope that's the case. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let me um, get into some thoughts here. When I first began thinking about this topic of gender a number of years ago, and it actually began, um, my, my mind started going in this direction, oh, m more than 20 years ago, when my boys were both in their late teens, early 20s, and we were together in one particular setting, just relaxing together. And, and I remember thinking, these two boys are now young men, and I want them to live as men. And I remember thinking, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what I want to say to them. As I say to them, I want you, to, I want you guys to be masculine. Um, I don't want to go into this, but I think we all could come up with stereotypes, both in the world and in the church. 
for what masculinity and femininity is. Um, I was raised in a very conservative Christian background, for which I'm mostly very grateful in many, many ways. But I heard time and time again as a kid up into my teenage years, early 20s, I heard a lot of talk about the role of women and I never heard a message on the role of men. I remember thinking, I'm really glad I'm not a woman stuck with some kind of a role, you know? And one of the, I've come to hate the word role. And I substitute, rather than use the word role, I like to think of the opportunity of men and women. What is our God-ordained opportunity and the uniqueness of our genderness? And I don't think we're gonna get anywhere, I don't think I'm gonna get anywhere, and really thinking about that clearly and avoiding the stereotypes that I think are a very real concern. Um, my, my views on submission, by the way, Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3, um, when I first got married, my views did not thrill my wife at all. And when I began looking at the scriptures a little more carefully, I remember just about, it hasn't been that long ago, four or five years ago, as I've been developing some, what I think are biblical understanding of submission, which I'll talk about this morning a little bit, I remember saying to my wife, uh, to Rachel, um, my nickname for my wife, by the way, is the DU, the director of the universe. <laughs> she's not a shrinking violet, trust me. Um, and I think she's very submissive, biblically defined. But as I was changing my views on submission, I said to her, what's that like for you to hear my different thinking from when we first got married? And she just burst out and said, relief. So I wonder what, how do we understand difficult words like submission, femininity, male leadership, masculinity, and all these stereotypical words that are so standard in the conservative culture and so hated by the secular culture as well as the liberal culture. Um, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere until and I said this this morning, but let me repeat it in a little different way, way. Until we start with the theology of the Trinity. This is not just a seminary classroom topic. This is a topic that I think we should all be obsessed with. Um, because it really is true that, as I said this morning, that they, they're, they're, they're a relational community and they relate in a way that is exactly the opposite of the way all of us come into this world inclined to relate. Think about that. There's only one verse in the Bible that I'm aware of, I'm sure there's others that I simply haven't seen, but 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 gives us a very brief and succinct and very clear definition of the word love. Only one verse in the Bible that I think gives a very clear, simple, not simplistic, but simple definition of love. And in the New Living Translation, of which I'm very fond, um, the verse reads something like this. Um, this is how we know what love really is, that Jesus shed his blood for us. Now, take that obvious sentence, we all know that's a truth, but take that obvious sentence and try to put it into a little more definitional category, and I would suggest this. Could it be that we can define love the way the Trinity, the three members of the Trinity love each other and obviously love us? Could we, could we think of it this way? A commitment, a joyful commitment, not a dutiful, not just, oh, I have to, but a joyful commitment to the well-being of another at any cost to oneself. Some of you know this sort of thing and some of you might not, it's new to me. But Trinitarian theologians talk about a distinction between the imminent trinity and the economic trinity. And the imminent trinity, as theologians use the term, is the way they relate amongst themselves. The three persons of the Godhead, one God, three persons. But the imminent trinity, the reason, we all would agree that the Father is fully God, correct? We'd all agree the Son is fully God, the Spirit is fully God, but there's not three gods. That's, that's tritheism, they call it. And it's not modalism, it's not one God who appears in three different modes. No, they're three distinguishable persons, but there's one God. Ask me to explain that, and I won't, because I can't. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery. But I would say this, that what defines, now let, look at it this way, if I could, um, if I had the ability to put three dogs, let me give a little simple little illustration. If I put three dogs, a collie, a schnauzer, and a Labrador, nobody would mistake any one of those dogs for a cat. 
or a monkey or a gorilla, they'd all say, well, that's a dog. But they're different dogs, but they're all dogs. So my question is, what's the dogness of dogs? What defines a dog is a dog. And to take that very low level illustration and then to ask the question, if there are three persons but one God, then what's the godness of God? What defines the Father, the Son, and the Spirit each as fully God? And the best answer I can come up with based on a lot of reading that I've done, and this might sound a little bit simplistic, I don't think it is, is that the godness of God is what Jonathan Edwards, a great theologian, the best theologian that America's ever produced, many think, um, he, he talks about, he has a very fancy phrase for it, don't be thrown by a fancy phrase, but he, he talks about what the, the godness of God can be defined by their dispositional ontology. Fancy phrase, the word ontology simply means being, and the disposition is inclined to move as a being. And it's very interesting that Edwards, what he actually did was he reversed a trend that began in the second or third century and lasted up until Edwards began teaching a couple hundred years ago. Um, he said that, that early Trinitarian theologians, as they were coming up with the doctrine of the Trinity, they were asking, what is the nature of God? And he said, you know, that's not a good question to ask because nature has a static feel to it. God is a, is a relational God. He's always in motion. He's always doing something relationally. So rather than saying, what's the nature of God? What is the dispositional, the inclination, the way God relates? His ontology is a, is a social, relational God. And he talks about the dispositional ontology of God in a way that fits with my understanding, that um, the dispositional ontology of the Father fully, the dispositional ontology of the Son and the Spirit each fully, is a commitment to the well-being of another at any cost to themselves. Y you see the exact opposite of self-centeredness. And then the term, the, the, um, the economic trinity, it refers not just to how the trinity gets along among themselves, but how these three persons, this one God, three persons, how then they relate to us. That's the economic trinity as theologians talk about it. And a, a Catholic theologian named Carl Rayner said that we need to understand that the economic trinity is the imminent trinity. There's no distinction. They relate to us the same way they relate to each other with a commitment to the well-being of another at any cost to themselves as clearly illustrated in Jesus. Talk about the sacrifice. And by the way, all three members of the Trinity suffered in Jesus' sacrifice. And there's a marvelous book by a German theologian named Jürgen Moltmann called The Trinity and the Kingdom of God. And Moltmann makes the point that the, that, the, that the passion of God has never been more fully felt than in the crucifixion, all three members. So here we have this God that relates with radical other-centeredness, pure other-centeredness. And I come into this world very different. How did David pray? In sin, after his Bathsheba episode, in sin did my mother conceive me. That's in the Bible, right? It's not referring to intercourse, because the bed's undefiled, according to Hebrews, in the husband and wife. So what he's saying is, from the very point that the sperm met the egg that is now me, I had a dispositional ontology that was absolutely antagonistic to God's. Jaya Packer calls it an anti-God virus. Romans 8, we, we, uh, uh, Paul talks about we're at enmity with God. And he makes a big point, John Owen does actually, he makes a big point about enmity with God, not that we're enemies of God, yes, that's true, but we're enemies of God because there's an enmity, there's a no that is not the way to live, and why don't you get it clear? I'm not going to go your way. Do you understand that, God? Now, that's in me, and it's in you from the point of conception. Forgiveness becomes a pretty big deal, doesn't it? And then transformation becomes a huge deal. But transformation, um, I'm very big on spiritual direction. I, I've kind of given up on psychotherapy, and now I believe in spiritual direction to some degree. And, but I think spiritual direction should be redefined as, uh, spiritual formation, rather, should be redefined as relational formation. It isn't just being moral, I'm all for that. It isn't just being honest, I'm all for that. But it's relation, it's, it's, it's relational formation. How can I receive the glory that the Father gave the Son that he's now given me through his Holy Spirit so that I can become one with each of you the way the Father and Son are one? Who is the Holy Spirit that indwells us? The Holy Spirit who indwells us, C.S. Lewis talks about that, other people do as well, top level theologians agree with this. But C.S. Lewis puts it very nicely. He said that the, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the relationship between the Father and Son. 
And then he makes the point that because their relationship of the, between the Father and Son is so infinite that the Holy Spirit himself is a person. You've all been around, haven't you, an older couple, been married for 50, 60, 70 years, whatever, and they have a great marriage, and you just sense a difficulty? No, oh, okay, no problem. No, oh, yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Oh, now I feel powerful, yeah. You've all been around an elderly couple that has known each other for years and have an unusually good relationship and you realize that there's a spirit about their relationship. When Rachel and I got married, we got um, the man that did our wedding ceremony was a man named George Landis. He was in his 80s. It was the last marriage he ever did and he was very close friends of Rachel's family and George and Sarah Landis, we were in their home for our premarital counseling session, which was very different back in our day. Um, Rachel and I were sitting on the couch together. We were gonna get married and we're sitting as close as we could without being blatantly immoral. And George and Sarah Landis in their 80s were sitting 10 feet apart in rocking chairs. She was knitting, she had a shawl with her hair in a bun and he had a big old sweater on and there was a dog and the, it was a Norman Walkwell painting, you know. And I remember as a 21-year-old kid just sitting next to this woman, I remember thinking, that couple is closer to each other, 10 feet apart, than Rachel and I are trying to touch body parts as much as we were allowed to. And I thought, I don't get that. Could we ever become like that? Well, we're married 48 years now, and, and we still sit pretty close to each other now and then, but something's more important to us than our sexual relationship. That's still present, and we're glad for it. And Lewis says that you see the spirit of this relationship and understand that the spirit that is now in you, Lewis says, is the spirit of that kind of love. That's why I believe at the core of my regenerate soul, at the core of your regenerate soul, the deepest desire in my heart is to love like Jesus. And then we gotta start thinking about this whole idea of relational femininity and relational masculinity because when Jesus, when God, the Trinity said, let us make a male and female, we talked about the two words, one that means um, open to receive and then in Mark 10, the Greek word that means uh, supply to nourish. And then the man's words, a car, is remember and move and then in, in Mark 10, the word in the Greek for male that Jesus used is a word are seen and it literally means the strength to move in a direction. Um, so I need to believe that I have the adequacy within my soul because of God to move, to remember the story of God and to advance his story by how I relate to you with the belief that the Spirit provides the weightiness within my soul to actually make a difference in your life as he so chooses. Can I believe that? If so, then I may be in the verge of becoming relationally masculine. So let me, um, let, let me talk about femininity first and then... If you have any time at all, we'll talk about masculinity. That's not a good thing to say, is it? Um, but let me give you a couple of brief thoughts. A lot of this is in the book, Fully Alive, but um, it's very striking in 1 Peter 3. I think we have some really good teaching in 1 Peter 3 that Peter gives us uh, and, and the whole marriage episode there in the first seven verses. And the, 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 his, his, his discussing male-female relationships and the marriage relationship begins with the word likewise. And that means you've got to look back at what the antecedent is. Like who? You look at the end of 1 Peter 2 and you realize you have Jesus hanging on the cross and committing himself, entrusting is the word in one of the translations, entrusting himself to his father is in the present progressive tense, which means he kept on entrusting himself to his father as nails were being pounded into his hands. Because he was receiving that which advanced the purposes of God. Likewise, women, He's not saying, go out and invite sexual abuse. Oh no, he's not coming close to that. But he is saying, You're, you are to submit by opening yourself to whatever advances God's purposes. And then it goes on to say, likewise, women, submit. The word for submit is hupatasso, and it's a word that literally means arrange yourself according to a larger design. The same word for female 
at Nechabah in uh, Genesis 1 occurs in 2 Kings 12 and verse 9 when a king named Joash uh, commissioned the high priest to collect money to repair the temple that was in disrepair. And Jehoiada, the high priest, he built a big collection plate, we might call it, back in those days. It wasn't a little plate we pass around, but it's a big old box to receive jewelry and other things of that nature. And he built this big chest, if you will, and he nekabod the box. He opened the box. And he opened the box to receive whatever was going to advance the purposes of God. Therefore, when I see the, 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 the calling for a woman to submit herself, to arrange herself according to a larger purpose, not simply to do what you're told, Now, some of you might differ with this. That's okay, I'm flying out of here in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> in our marriage ceremony 48 years ago, we did have the very traditional cer ceremony where Rachel promised to obey me. I never promised to obey her. If you were getting married today, I would drop the word obey. Because I believe she's to obey God. And I'm to obey God. And I believe that she is to submit to me Obviously, Ephesians talks about mutual submission. I understand that, but in 1 Peter 3, we're talking about it. And I believe she is to submit to me according to whatever advances the purposes of God. When I was in private practice, a woman called me up for an emergency appointment. She came in, and she said, I knew the woman a little bit, um, happily married, good Christian marriage, good church people, all the right things Christian-wise. Christian and she said, I am blown away. I've never thought this would happen in a million years. My husband came to me just two nights ago and said he's made, made arrangements for us to swap partners with a couple in our Bible study. Should I submit to him? How many would say yes, she should submit to him? Raise your hand. I think you're all wrong. Raise your hand. She ought to submit to him by saying no. Submission advances the purposes of God. Is she going to advance the purposes of God by having sex with a next-door neighbor? Of course not. But the Bible says very clearly in 1 Peter 3, wives submit to your husbands with what the, the, the word Peter uses in King James is with a gentle and a quiet spirit because that is the beauty that you have. It's the way you relate that is your feminine beauty. And the word gentle is a literal word that literally means incapable of being destroyed. Husband, you want me to have sex with this neighbor guy? You want to swap partners? You can't destroy the truest part of my relational beauty. You have no power to do that because God's given it to me. Therefore, I don't need to, what are you doing? I'm going to beat you up and just yell at you and tell you what a jerk you are. I don't need to do that. I'm going to submit to you with a gentle spirit because you can't destroy me. And I'm going to submit to you with a quiet spirit. And the word quiet basically in the original means something like don't get even. No payback. So therefore, I believe a submissive wife at that point would say, no, I will not do that. Very firmly, but not, I will not do that, you scum. That's not submission. But I will not do it. But let me tell you what, I, what is true of you, husband. Should you choose to move according to God's directions, you're going to find an incredibly nourishing wife. But what you're doing is not advancing God's direction. What is your beauty, ladies? I keep a little pencil portrait of Mother Teresa on the wall in my house. I heard her speak at a prayer breakfast when Bill Clinton was president. And I was blown away by her feminine beauty. Now, I don't mean to be unkind. Physically, she wasn't pretty. But let me tell you, when I look at a Hollywood starlet, I lust. When I look at Mother Teresa, I worship. She was talking about, at that prayer breakfast, to 5,000 of us there with Bill Clinton and the president. She said, um, oh, and said very kindly but very strongly, Oh, the greatest sin of America is killing babies. Oh, bring them all to me. And I thought, Jesus, saying, come to me. And I thought, man, is she feminine. It's unbelievable. Because she's pretty, she's dressed in a beautiful dress or something? No, because she's relationally feminine. Let me tell you a quick story. I chaired a department of counseling and we led a master's program in counseling at two different schools and a school in Colorado where I was the chairman of the department for 10 years my faculty came to me one day and said we have a, a, a student a co-ed a woman 26 years old physically a very beautiful woman but she's causing all kind of trouble in the um, program and I said what's happening 
And she said, I don't know, she's mad about something. And she's getting all the students to, a lot of the students to kind of side with her against some of the professors. Um, Larry, you've got to deal with it, you're the chairman. And I thought I'd resign, um, but I didn't. So I, I said, well, tell her to make an appointment, she did. And this woman, 26 year old at the time, came into my office for a three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon appointment. Never forget what happened, it happened just the way. Um, I want to be kind here. Is the word snippy okay to use? My goodness, was he snippy. And when I opened the door, when she knocked on the door for the appointment, I opened it, she stood there in a way that just terrifies men. The way you women stand can be so dangerous. As soon as I opened the door, she literally, I hope I don't do this too well, but she, so, you gonna kick me out of the program? That's how she started. And so much in me was, yes. <laughs> but flesh, spirit, struggle, I said, come on in. Have a seat, okay. Where's I sit? Over there's fine. Good, no problem. Wanna ask you a question? Sure, whatever you want. Just ask me questions, I'm okay. Just like this, talk about incredibly unfeminine. Well, I said, well, here's a question I want to ask you. And um, it took about 15 minutes to ask all this. I'll do this, to, obviously, much more briefly. But for the next 15 minutes, I said things like this. I said, I just want to know what happened when you turned 13. I want to know uh, what it was like for you when your dad said to you, honey, your birthday's coming up in two weeks. You're going to turn 13. You're entering into, you're entering into womanhood in a new way. And I want to take you out and buy the prettiest dress you ever had in your life and take you out for dinner on your birthday and just be together as your father with my, with my precious daughter that I am so privileged to be the father to. And what was it like when your dad took you out to that dress store and, and you tried on different dresses and you came out and you, you twirled around and your dad said, oh, beautiful, and you found the right one that you just loved? What was it like when your dad said, I don't care what it costs. I'm not rich, but I'm going to buy this for you. You just, uh, I just want to bring out the physical beauty that it reflects the, the relational beauty within your soul. What was it like when the evening came for the dinner and your dad um, went out and washed the car all afternoon and came in and shined his shoes and it was time to go out to dinner and your mother went into your bedroom and got you all dressed up and fixed your hair and your dad put on his best suit and you got to the car and he opened the door for you and you slid in and your dad drove to this nice restaurant and you sat down and had a meal together and what was it like when as you just had this wonderful meal and good conversation your dad at the, at the end of the meal reached across the table and put his, um, put his hand on your hand and in a very wonderful fatherly way and just said the joy of being your father knows no limits. The beauty of who you are as a young woman just thrills my soul, and my chance to bring it out in your life is what I'm committed to. What was it like when all that happened? What was she doing by now after 15 minutes of that? She was crying. It had never happened. I knew it never happened. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been such a pain in the neck if that would have happened, probably. I was speaking at the American Association of Christian Counselors about three, four years ago, doing a workshop on gender, and um, there were about 400 people there, and Karen, the woman I'm talking about, I have permission to tell the story, she was in the room with 400 people. And I just told the story much longer than I told it here. And when I finished telling the story, I said, would you like to meet the woman I'm talking about? And the people, yeah. And so Karen stood up. This is like three years ago. And I said, Karen, anything you want to add to my story that I get it right? She said, well, there's one thing you never knew I'd like to point out now. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, and she said, when, when, when I just got a hold of the fact of how invisible I felt as a woman, as a young girl. Nobody saw me and delighted in me. And when I saw you gently leading me in that direction, I felt, literally, I felt ice over my heart begin to melt. And something in me became aware of a desire, I don't wanna be a snippy young girl. I wanna be relationally feminine. So much more could be said, but let me, let me talk about masculinity now. I'm just hitting the High points, obviously. The book might go into a lot more. Manhood. Masculinity. I think one of the best places to look to understand masculinity is in Exodus 2, verses 23 and 24. In Exodus 2, we have the story of where um, God looked down and saw the children of Israel groaning in slavery. Remember the passage? And the Bible says, and I want to tell you why I think this is a, a good launching point to think about masculinity to respond to your question. Um, it says that God did four things in these passages in Exodus 2, 23 and 24. It says that God heard their cry. It says that God remembered, and the word is zakar, 
same word for male. God remembered his covenant. And then it says God looked into, he explored. He, he looked down, not down condescendingly, but down into their reality. He got to know. He, he wanted to be very aware of all that was happening. And then it says, and he knew it was time to act. Four things, heard, remember, explored, and moved. Now think about that in terms of masculine, relational masculinity, heard. I think curiosity is the lost art of the American church. We don't hear each other. How many times have you said to a buddy over lunch or friend or spouse, whatever, hey, I saw a good movie yesterday. And your friend said, oh, I saw one too. As opposed to, what movie did you see? Oh, I saw that. I didn't like it. As opposed to, I didn't like it, but you did. Tell me why. Why do we not hear? Let me tell you why I think men don't hear. I think it's very masculine to hear because God hears. And if we're to reveal the relational nature of God, we're going to hear what's going on in somebody else's soul. Do you know how to listen to your wife? Do you know how to listen to your kids, your friends? I think the reason it's hard for us to hear is because if you really tell me all that's going on in you, I'm not going to know what to do. So when Rachel says to me, I just feel so beside myself, a typical man's response is what? Well, let's just go out for dinner and you'll feel better. Yeah, a couple of women going, yeah, that's all yeah, yeah. As opposed to, well, what, what are you talking about? I don't understand. I, I really would like to hear. There's a marvelous passage in Malachi 3. Malachi, you know, where the Jews ended up the Old Testament in terrible shape. Um, seven times God scolds them, rebukes them, and each time when he scolds them, they say, what are you talking about? They didn't have any sense of their own sinfulness. But in Malachi 3, in verse somewhere 16, I think it is, he talks about a, a little remnant. I love remnant theology. There was a little group of Jews that were very faithful to God, and they, they gathered together and spoke often in his name. And the Bible says God listened and he heard. And the word for listen really means to get your attention. If, if uh, we were to close our time now and I were to walk out, and somebody would say, Larry, and I heard you, and I'd say, oh, yes? That's what it means to listen, to get my attention. But then the word heard literally means to put your ear next to somebody else's mouth. Not only do you have my attention, but I want to hear what's going on in you. Masculine men listen and hear. Masculine men say, I want to know what's going on. Not to judge you, but to know you. And then to remember Second part of masculine, relational masculinity, to remember the large story of God from eternity past, the, echina, the imminent trinity, enjoying each other profoundly and then making a decision to make us. Why do you think, here's a side, side thought real quickly, why do you think this happy community of God, they were not lonely, they were enjoying each other. Why do they bother to make people like us? knowing full well that we were going to screw it up and with Adam and Eve and follow in their tradition and be committed to our, my own well-being at any cost to you. The exact opposite of the dispositional ontology of the Trinity. Why do you suppose they made us? I'll give you my thought. A little strange, maybe a little heretical, I don't think so, but was it easy for the Father to love the Son? Well, of course. <laughs> easy for the Son to love the Father? Well, of course. But their love is so profound, they can love unlovable people. That's why they made me. Because I am at enmity. I come into the world saying, it's all about me. You want to cooperate, God, fine. If you don't, to heck with you. And God says, I love you. So he puts on display the depths of his love by making people like us. And can I get a hold of that story that that's who God is imminently and economically and the day's going to come when all of us who know Jesus are going to be dancing with the Trinity forever and it's going to be a really good time no more cancer no more divorce no more sexual abuse no more sexual disorders no more nothing that's bad it's all going to be good and I want to advance the plot of that story by how I talk to people particularly my wife and kids and my friends of course do I remember the story of God and get so excited about the story that's being told and the excitement, by the way, doesn't always feel giddy. The excitement often feels purposeful. Folks, the older I get, there are times 
I really want to quit. I'm tired in my soul. But the degree to which I know the story of God, I want to press on and finish well. Remember the story and advance the purposes of God. Masculinity, point two. Point three, explore. Not only have a, as a relational and masculine man listen, not only do you, do you hear, but you really want to know. You want to say, honey, can we go out to, to, to coffee next week? And I, can we sit together for two hours? I want to get to know who you are. 25 years ago almost, um, Rachel and I hit a hard point in our marriage and we were just kind of bored with each other. And so we, um, I was speaking in um, New Zealand, I think it was, and so we decided to take a stop in Scotland right on the way. Um, <laughs> I'm not good at geography. So we, we went to Scotland to a very non-touristy place and we spent uh, five days there and all we did for five days, and this was my idea, Rachel was, went along with it and added much to it, we began to explore the different parts in our lives from um, zero to five early childhood and I said to Rachel, honey, for the first five years of your life, who did God most use to touch your feminine soul and who did Satan most use to harm your feminine soul? Ages zero to five. And then how about late childhood, 6 to 12? Who did God most use? Who did Satan most use? Ages 6 to 12. Teenage years, um, 13 to 19, 20. Who did God most use to bless who you really are as a woman? Who did Satan most use to make you question whether there's any beauty in your soul at all? Whether you're just kind of a you know, pretty body and nothing more to you than that. Who did Satan most use to deal with that with you? And then on into the different phases of our marriage. And we sat probably every day, five days for about six or seven hours and did nothing but talk like that. I tell you folks, I felt relationally masculine. I explored that woman and she explored me. It was wonderful. It was a really a reconnecting in between her, my wife and I. And then lastly, he knew it was time to act. He moved. You hear, you remember, you explore. And it's at that point that I believe if you take the time to hear and remember and explore, something's going to come alive within your soul, gentlemen, and you're going to realize, I really want to do this now. I want to say this. I want to say nothing and just hold her. I want to do this. I want to do that. And something's going to come alive, and you can blame the Spirit for that. And when you do that, you're going to make an impact. That's relational masculinity. Let me finish with this. Our time is just about up. How many of you are familiar with the word perichoresis? All right, one or two of you. It's a word that was created, concocted, if my understanding, in the third or fourth century by a pastor, a theologian, who realized that his people were not excited about the Trinity at all. And so he came up with an effort to try to understand how they relate so women can reveal the relational nature of God and men can reveal the relational nature of God in invitational ways and in moving ways. And he said, we're, we're not going to get our femininity and masculinity, um, we're not going to get excited about it, about the privilege of it, until we understand something about how they relate. And so he came up with the word, uh, perichoresis, the word uh, P-E-R-I, around, perimeter, means around, you know, perimeter. And choresis comes from the root choreography, dancing. And he said, it's, it's, it means that they're dancing around. And, and um, perichoresis really has a meaning of, of dancing around, but more literally, that's sort of metaphorically, but more literally, the idea, to put it at a simplest level, that's a very complicated thing that's beyond my scope, but as I understand it, it, it really comes down to this. What is most alive within me that resembles God that I can give to you as I relate with you? I spent 10 years in private practice as a therapist. You know what I came to realize? the people I helped the most were not the people I was most clever with. They were not the people that my techniques of therapy were evident mostly in their skillfulness. The people that I think I impacted the most were the people, and I wish there were many of them, but there were some, where I became aware of what's so alive in me that I poured it into them and our souls connected. Wendell, I think you said to me earlier that it felt poured into a little bit. I just love that phrase, poured into. How do we pour into each other perichoretically? Here's the last thing I'll say to you. Relation, it's all about relationships. There's a secular psychologist, not an American psychologist, and he said, um, I have spent the last 10 years with my army of research assistants trying to understand what a trained counselor has to offer a counselee. 
And he said, I've concluded it's not their theoretical orientation and it's not their skill. He said, I believe that what a trained counselor offers a counselee can be boiled down to this. This is a secular man, no Christian axe to grind. He said, there's one thing we, we know now from all the research, and he put it this way. When you're hurting, sometimes it's helpful to talk to somebody you trust. I went through five years of graduate school for that. I should have gotten that in church. <laughs> Folks, it's all about relationships. And until we get that down clear in our minds and learn what it means to be masculine and feminine, I think our sexual struggles are going to win. But the degree to which we become men and women is the degree to which we're going to look at our sexual desires that are still going to be strong at times. But we're going to say, that gets in the way of what I most want who I most want to be, what I most want to do. And when that becomes real, then I think victory becomes a real word and not just a sweet platitude. Father, use these very brief remarks somehow for your, your purposes. Accomplish anything you want to accomplish through these feeble words of mine. Thank you for the chance to be together in Christ's name. Amen.